Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. This is Bob DeMarco. I'm here with Ed Cope, custom knife maker extraordinaire, proprietor of Valhalla Knives Company, and basic man of adventure from his Instagram feed. Ed, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Uh, so uh, I, I wanted to find out. So in, in looking at your Instagram feed, uh, we were talking right before we came on here that uh, um, I find out I found out about you by Spirited Blades. He's a guy on uh, Instagram and YouTube who comes on our show frequently and was showing off a knife he got from you, the LR6. Uh, yep. A very beautiful and impressive knife. Um, but I, I kind of want to find out before we get to that. How did you come around to this knife making? I know you've uh, you've been in the service and you fly. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, well. Knife making for me started with my grandfather when I was a little kid. He, my grandfather was a tool and die maker for Sterrett's tool company uh, for 40 years. And when I was a little kid, he'd take me to yard sales, whatever, and collect little pocket knives and stuff like that. And he used to make some knives in his spare time on the weekends and whatnot. So that's where my love for knives kind of started. Uh, and then through the military, I used to just carry a bunch of different knives, like uh, mostly CRKT stuff. Uh, and then when I moved out to Hawaii, I met Tom Mayo uh, through a small group at, um, through church at my house and had no idea that the, there was a whole world out there of custom knife makers. And uh, just talking to people, I met Tom and asked him what he did. He said he was a knife maker. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. My grandfather made some knives and I showed him one that my grandfather made for me uh, before I joined the military. And uh, it's something just told me that there was something different about what Tom was doing. So after he left my house, I, I Googled his name and realized that <laughs> this is an actual business. Cause I was thinking at the time, how can somebody survive in Hawaii making knives? That's ridiculous. Well, I think it's funny that you, you, uh, you had to Google him after he left because I'm sure a lot of our listeners are thinking, oh my God, Tom Mayo, the legend, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, that's that. So your grandfather, I, I want to go to that. Your grandfather made your first knife before you were deployed. Was that to take on deployment or was that just something he made for you early on? It was uh, something I had asked him to do for me uh, right as before I joined the military, um, sort of like a, I guess, going to war type present. Um, I never carried it though because it was just too sentimental for me. Too precious. Well, well, tell me about what it was, uh, what that knife was like, and how he made it, and kind of what that meant to you. So, he had a tiny little shop, uh, and he was living in New Mexico at the time when he made it. Um, I'm not sure where he got the steel for it, but he took his shop back and hooked the hose up to the blower side and put that into like a charcoal. Um, like a little Kingsman charcoal thing. And that's how he made a forge to heat it up. And uh, that's how he heat treated it. But he, he, I think he ground it just on a bench grinder and then made a uh, brass hilt and uh, I think is a micarta handle for it. So did that, uh, seeing that your, <clears throat> excuse me, seeing that your grandfather could just uh, just make a knife out of thin air, so to speak, is, yeah. is that something that, that inspired you? Is that something that runs in your family, that handiness, that uh, ability uh, yeah, to make actually, stuff? Yeah. So my, that's my grandfather on my mom's side. Uh, my dad is a woodworker. Um, when I was in high school, I was a floor sander. That's kind of where that carried into being able to use a grinder and, and actually sand and shape stuff. Uh, my two uncles on my mom's side, so my grandfather's son's, uh, they both build climbing walls, but one of them um, remodels old houses, and the other one uh, is a custom motorcycle builder, like builds motorcycles from the ground up. So there's, there's quite a bit of uh, craftsmanship that runs in my family. So it sounds like you all make tools to make life better <laughs> in a way, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, motorcycles and knives, you know, we all know those make life better so what, what just describe this grandpa's knife 
uh, before I let it drop. Because uh, my grandfather made my brother a knife. That was also my, uh, my mom's father. Uh, made my brother a knife. And he didn't make me one, not, not, that he, not for any reason other than my brother asked. But I always kind of wished he made one for Describe the knife your grandfather made for you. Uh, so it was like a, a Bowie style knife, um, like I said, with a micarta handle and he made a, uh, a sheath for it that was, had wood on the inside with like leather over top of the wood. Um, and when he had quenched it, it sort of had like this odd pattern that developed on the surface of the metal that he left there rather than grinding off. Uh, so it's kind of rough and unfinished looking something that you'd expect to come out of you know a, a weekend knife maker's garage or something like that but uh, um this thing was super sharp and it still is wow. well you said that he lined the sheath with um with wood and then they made yep. the sheath with, with leather it sounds to me did he have any uh experience in the service or using knives it sounds like something you would do if you're jumping out of an airplane i know that's something you do i'm uh, just curious uh because you don't want that knife poking through the leather when you land or I don't know, you know, I've never done that before. So I don't know what the circumstances are, but yeah, you know, I never asked him why he did that. Uh, but that's probably a good reason. Uh, he was uh, a tail gunner in a B 24 in world war two. Oh, and he actually, I, I was airborne in the army, but um, I don't have any combat jumps. My grandfather actually did have one combat jump when he bailed out of his B 24. So B-24 Liberator, when I was growing up, was always my favorite World War II plane. And um, <clears throat> I, I, I have a little knife that I made that is exactly what you described, a rough weekenders, uh, yeah. weekend knife maker's knife, but I call it the Liberator after that airplane. And um, if anyone's ever read the, well, no, actually, that's about a ball turret gunner. But we know that being a tail gunner was an incredibly hazardous and dangerous job. And uh, man, yeah. that's... That's uh, that's quite a legacy that went into that knife. So tell yeah. me about your service. First of all, thank you for voluntarily uh, taking on the responsibility of protecting my family and the rest of our families here. Uh, what did you do when you were in the service? Uh, so I joined in October of 2003. Uh, in the first four years, I was in 2nd Ranger Battalion in, in uh, Fort Lewis, Washington and uh, got tired of walking and carrying heavy shit. So I went aviation for uh, six years after that. So did a, a total of about 12 and a half years active service. So uh, Rangers, uh, they're, they're kind of a special group in the army. Yeah, I, mean, I guess like special forces, right? Yeah, so, they, all, they fall under SOCOM. Okay, so, so you got a lot of highly specialized training um, there in survival and combat and that kind of thing. But then you, you took that training and you, and you went airborne. What, what was the, uh, airborne, um, division or company or whatever that you went into? You'll have to forgive me. I'm not a military man, so I don't know exactly how to talk about it, but what was the outfit you went into? So, uh, after I left Ranger Battalion, uh, went to flight school and there was such an influx of people going to flight school at the time. So it was a, a two year process for me. Uh, my wife also went through fly school and I think she was only there for about a year to a year and a half. But, um, I spent two years there, a good, I think nine months of it was on hold waiting for courses to start. Uh, and I chose Kiowa's, uh, to fly, which is a small recon attack helicopter. Uh, and I had mainly at the time chose it because I wanted to, eventually go into flying the Little Bird in 160 Special Operations Aviation. That, that and, little uh, loach, the one that's like a teardrop yeah, shape? Yeah, a loach, yeah. Yep. Um, and so I, I chose the Kiowa because it was the most similar to that. And uh, I was going to originally do it out of flight school. Uh, guys with prior SOCOM experience are allowed to apply and some get picked up for that. but. Uh, the base selection came out and I got Hawaii. So I decided to go to Hawaii and see how that goes and ended up getting stuck here. Well, Hawaii sounds like a sweet deal, but I know there's a lot of strategic uh, value uh, to Hawaii. What kind of stuff did you do once you were uh, shipped there? Uh, so in Hawaii, I deployed once with them to Afghanistan uh, during 2012. As we were 
2012 was supposed to make the switch to nine month deployments, but because our orders got cut prior to 2012, we were the last unit to do a full year tour. Um, but I got about 750 combat hours uh, flying to Kiowa there, doing mostly recon stuff. It was a lot of fun. So when you're flying a recon mission in a war zone, does that mean you're you're going in maybe not unarmed, but way less armed than than the rest of the tr people that are coming in behind you? Like, what's that like running a recon mission? So uh, for on the aviation side, um, basically we were flying around in our area of operation, looking for things that didn't fit in, uh, patterns of life that didn't fit in, so that we could investigate them further to see if something would develop out of that and we worked with some uh pathfinders that we had that were from hawaii and we also had uh, lithuanian special forces with their equivalent of rangers and seals that were there working with us and so we would go out sometimes and find something uh, that seemed out of the ordinary so we'd call them in to land near the target and see what was going on Sometimes that would develop into something big, and sometimes it was nothing at all. So is that uh, is that nerve wracking flying around, uh, just kind of knowing you're, because presumably you're you're going out there before anyone else, because it's reconnaissance, and it's <clears throat> I would imagine somewhat uncharted territory. What kind of uh, first of all, what kind of nerve does it take to do that, and what kind of like survival gear and stuff do you bring with you? What are you expecting? Um, most of that area had been flown in, uh, before, but it was like, it, the area that we had was very spread out and there wasn't, um, large cities. There was only a couple of them along the main route. And we had a couple bases that were spread out through that area. So anything outside of that base was considered, you know, hostile territory. So every time we took off, we were flying around. Um, we were flying around the hostile territory, but um, truth be told that it was rumored that the uh, the top enemy personnel were actually within 10 miles of our base because that's where they felt the safest. Because like we'd always go out close. farther. Yeah, we'd go out farther looking for stuff, you know. And... Wow. So, okay, uh, you know about... Uh... Doug Ritter of Knife Rights, and, and uh, he, he, uh, he's the, the man, he's a survival specialist who came up with the uh, Ritter Griptilian uh, and also a, another very famous uh, folding knife, the Ritter RSK. He also runs uh, Knife Rights, a national organization to help, uh, you know, with, uh, well, exactly what it sounds like, Knife Rights. Anyway, he was a helicopter pilot and, and came up with a whole protocol for survival, um, you know, in, in the case of a crash. In a helicopter, uh, what you know is that is that a different sort of scenario than regular uh, flying a regular fixed wing airplane, in terms of the kind of hazards you expect and what kind of gear you might bring along to survive something awful. Uh, the gear that we carried, uh, it was I mean, most of that was prescribed by the military on, on mm. a minimum of what we would have, and my particular helicopter is actually very limited due to weight and. Uh, just because uh, the airframe came out in 1969, and that's when the Army put into active service, and it was very light back then and powerful, but over time they kept adding equipment to it, and they never upgraded it. Um, the majority of it, they never upgraded past the late 80s. So we were way overweight, uh, underpowered, and we were flying. The base altitude that I took off from was uh, about 6,200 feet. So we were flying anywhere from 6,200 feet up to 10,000, 11,000 feet. Wow. Uh, so we didn't have a lot of extra weight to carry stuff around, but we had um, all aviators fly with a survival radio um, and then uh, ASIC knife, which is basically a, a Bowie knife uh, with some, it's got like a, a butt plate on it for breaking glass, which everything in, in helicopters is all plexiglass. Um, and then, uh, just some basic survival stuff like fire starters, space blanket, that type of thing. Uh, so you, you have your, your time in the military when you get out, what, what is the thing that pushes you towards knife making? There are so many other things, 
a young motivated man could do. What was it about knife making that really made you say, no, this is, this is what I want to do? Um, I think the biggest draw was being able to work for myself. Um, I saw a lot of leadership in the military that I really didn't like. Um, big lack of common sense. And I wanted to be able to make my own decisions on how I should run my business um, and my life. So that's, I think that's the biggest part of my motivation to go into knife making. Well, yeah, I could see that uh, from you know, the perspective of a non-military man thinking like, I could see how uh, if you're kind of taking orders and, and following those orders as you should be, because that's your job, but you're not necessarily agreeing with them when you're when you're outside of that situation or finally released from that situation. You might seek uh, the opposite. Let me ask you this, and, and I'm not trying to ask you to impugn anything, but like, what kind of is it bureaucratic? Is that what was driving you nuts uh, about the decision making? Is it the bureaucracy of military or? Yeah, uh, I mean, um, in the beginning of uh, the GWAT and global war on terrorism, um, units were deploying constantly and it was, you literally come back from a deployment and it was normal to PCS or move to another unit. And then what the military was doing back then was they would move people from one unit that just got back from deployment into another unit that was about to deploy. So these guys were deploying constantly and they got burnt out and tired of it. So a lot of them that could do a job on the outside, uh, and were smart enough to got out and did something else. Well, a lot of the crappier leadership stayed in uh, the military and then they rose up through the ranks and you have this culture of toxic leadership and uh, it, they were all just looking for their next promotion and not worried about hmm. their guys underneath them. And that was the biggest thing is watching decisions being made for personal gain uh, and preservation of their own career versus, you know, all the guys underneath you. That's kind of something you expect to see maybe in, in some, uh, some parts of the private world, private industry. But um, those of us who are idealists like to think that in something as important as the military, maybe that's not going to happen. But, uh, but humans are involved, right? So it's, yeah. It's gonna happen. So, what was your first knife design that that uh, you, you you come back, you start making knives? What was the one that broke through for you? Um, so, actually, I I came back from deployment and I had started on a knife that was a lot like uh, the was it, I think it was a Tom Brown tracking knife, mm -hmm. um, very similar to the one that you see in the movie The Hunted. And that was just for myself, for my own benefit and something that I wanted to make. And I'm pretty sure Mayo actually threw that away because I know I left it in his shop and it disappeared. Um, and that was back in 2013. So <laughs> um, I'd actually, I had a uh, notebook or a binder that I started drawing sketches in and I uh, had a lot of fireball whiskey one night and it was just, drawing stuff and woke up the next morning is flipping through the binder and opened up the page and saw this design that I had drawn that I didn't even remember drawing until I looked at it. And that, that actually became the first folding knife that I made. Um, and I showed it to Tom Mayo and he liked it and did some research online and we couldn't find anything similar to it. So he went into like a collaboration with me where he was making it and putting my name on it for, I think I made 25 of them. And that was sort of like my, my foot in the door. Well, that's, that's quite a foot in the door. Uh, uh, explain, describe to people who uh, Tom Mayo is. Um, to me, uh, Tom is sort of like a, a dad to me. Uh, it, but I would say it's more like my wife says, he's, um, I'm Dennis the Menace and he's, uh, <laughs> The older guy there, I can't think of his name, um, but no, we ha we have a really good relationship. Uh, kind of always giving each other crap, but um, he's uh, given me a lot of mentorship over the years and uh, helped me out a lot in, in quite a different 
quite a few ways uh, in this community. I mean, if I didn't have Tom as a mentor when I started off, there's I would be five to ten years behind where I am now. Uh, to, to those who might not know who he is, um, and and I don't know uh, a lot about Tom Mayo, but I do know that his knives are are, are his folding knives are very um, beautiful, simple, and um, just. Uh, clean paragons of the of the i mean they, they are the state of the art if if you will i know a lot of uh custom knife makers or custom knife collectors really covet his work and i i have to admit i've never i've never held one i've only appreciated them from afar like your knives uh but what what kind of things have you learned from him is it the whole craft did you learn everything about the art from him or is it more a um you know like a spiritual download you got from him um I mean, he taught me all the basics that I needed to know on how to make a folder. Um, that's what we, on the, the first, um, what he called the egg coat design model that he made, which is my, my flagship model, the R33. Uh, the first one that we had made, we went through, started off in plexiglass uh, based off of my design. And uh, once we had prototyped it in plexiglass, um, I started grinding it out in titanium uh, and steel and whatnot. And then that was, that was right before I had to deploy to Korea in January of 2015. Uh, and I, I had had probably eight or nine months uh, in, in uh, 2014 to finish it. And I, I was too afraid to grind the blade and mess it up because I hadn't done much grinding at that point. Um, so I, I gave it to him to finish. He actually finished it right before I left and changed some things up on it. But uh, he basically taught me the all the mechanics of creating a folder and, and why things are the way they are on a folder, what makes them, what makes it good and what makes it reliable. So resulting from that, what would you, how would you describe the style of your work? Um, I, the, I I'll, I'll do anything from in, in between Tom Mayo getting closer towards uh, Mick Strider. Um, I really like Strider's style, and that's uh, what I've always wanted to, to where I wanted to take my business. Um, but he definitely does way nicer stuff. Uh, a lot of I like like a lot of the, the steampunk style of things that he does. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I I would say I probably fall somewhere in between the two. Uh, but so, so you would say tactical, but, uh, may, I mean, well, look, I don't mean to put words in your mouth. Would you call them tactical knives before I continue? Um, not really. I mean, it, it's, for me, it's hard to define what tactical means as a folder because, uh, in my mind as, you know, a, a young soldier in the army, something tactical was, uh, I would just go buy something that looked like Rambo's knife, you know, um, and I carried, like I said, I carried a lot of CRKT stuff uh, when I was younger. So to me, that was like tactical, just something simple, something with a matte finish, uh, you know, in, in like FDE or green or black or something like that. So I would say the stuff that I make is more along um, like collector style, more dress knife. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, for sure. I was being a little bit coy there. I mean, it definitely you look at your work and the materials and the, and that craftsmanship definitely, you know, holler out loud. These are collectible custom made knives. I guess I was going more for the format of them. You know, they look aggressive. They have, uh, they seem from pictures and from what I've heard from Ryan, etc., to have like fantastic action and great, uh, blade grinds and steel that is, uh, perfect for the purpose, but not, not an overextension, you know, uh, I think I'm I'm finding that a lot. Um, production companies try and raise the price by adding the craziest newest steel, but custom knife makers who are making some of the finest work stick with 154 cm or D2 or steels that they've used that they know how to heat treat. They know how to make uh, work perfectly. Um, D, would you say that you're? I mean, what influences your designs? Um. You know, at the beginning, uh, I really liked uh, Anzo's work. 
Um, and I think that's where that, that my first model, the R33, kind of grew out of, of inspiration from him. Uh, but nowadays, I just kind of start with different lines uh, that blend well together and just kind of see, see if I can just grow that into a knife. Um, some of my stuff is a lot more aggressive and crazy looking, and some of the other stuff is just really simple and clean. The, uh, the R33 is that uh, swedged Warncliffe um, yep. knife that is really has, a, I, I mean, that's the first knife that I think of when I think of your name. Uh, but then I also think of the, uh, the LR6 only mm. because uh, Ryan showed it off and it's, man, that, of, of all the designs of yours I've seen, that's the one that strikes a huge chord as well as the LC17L of the recurved Tanto. That's pretty, yeah. pretty cool. Um, but uh, so so with these knives, do, tell me the, your process, okay? So um, I'm looking at your shop behind you. Well, I can't tell anything from the view, but uh, in my mind, I see you drawing. I guess you mentioned that before. You have a notebook full of designs. Do you keep it all in that sort of hand uh, hand drawn, handmade realm? Yeah, uh, I actually had tried downloading a, a program or software for my iPad to sort of draw. CAD style stuff. I just didn't like it. I, I like being able to do everything by hand because I can see everything. I feel like I have better control over that. Right. Um, but I, I hand sketch everything out. Um, there's a lot of stuff in my notebook that's just, I look back at it and I'm like, it's garbage. Um, sometimes it's, you just need to get those ones out of the way before you find something that you like. Uh, and it, I don't try to push it. I try to just kind of let it come organically. Uh, sometimes I'll be sitting watching TV and, and out of nowhere, I won't even be thinking about knives and out of nowhere, something will pop into my head and I'll grab my notebook and start sketching it. And that's kind of where the, uh, the LC 17 came from. It's just something that popped into my head and it, I think it started with a, a portion of the handle, uh, Actually, I was watching um, Ford versus Ferrari, hmm. and that portion of the handle popped into my head, and I just designed the rest of it from that idea. It could look like the taillight of, a, of an exotic car or, yeah, in, any yeah. number of, yeah. Um, so so the, uh, the process of drawing and then hand-making... Does that preclude you from like collaboration work, or do you have a do you have aims to do collaborations uh, with any of your designs uh, with uh, production companies, or is this something you want to keep strictly um, Ed Cope hands on? Um, so I did well as far as uh, so collaborations with other makers. Um, I haven't really talked to a whole lot of other people about doing stuff like that. I mean, obviously, the first knife that I made was a a collaboration with Tom. Um, but since then I haven't really talked to other makers about doing that stuff. I, I like to have complete, uh, creative freedom with the stuff that I'm making. Um, it kind of stems from that whole thing with the military uh, of not being subject to somebody else's ideas when I think I have a better way of doing it, you know, or just yeah. not even necessarily a better way, but just it's the way that I know works for me. So does that for you uh, extend naturally to companies like We and Riot and Best Tech? That's what I was getting at. Like the yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so I have uh, in the past spoken to a couple other companies that um, American-based companies that didn't seem too interested. Um, so that I took into my own hands to seek out somebody in the U.S. that could make something. Uh, so it was all made in USA and. The goal was not to create more income for myself. It, what I wanted to do is uh, I was going to these shows and I noticed that, <clears throat> you know, like myself that got into the, uh, the knife world, I started off with uh, sub $100 knives, you know, buying like CRKT just to, to carry stuff. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what anything was back then. And at the shows, you see people buying, you know, ten thousand dollar knives. Uh, a collaboration from Tom and, and Barker, and 
even my entry prices uh, start at eight hundred dollars and a thousand dollars and i saw this whole crowd of people that are out there that couldn't quite afford an eight hundred dollar knife but they like my design mm -hmm. so i was like well wait a minute maybe i can you know do something with a production model that is affordable for that mid-level collector around the three to four hundred dollar mark um so what i did was I took one of my designs, uh, my flagship model, the R33, um, but I took the flipper version of it and was talking to a bunch of different people. Um, I can't remember what knife maker it was that told me about him, but uh, the guy ended up going with us up. He was up in New York and I was, I think, in Tennessee. Um, but basically hmm. changed some stuff around on this. So it's all... Uh, flat grind because it's a uh, five axis CNC made and then design the handle myself. That's gorgeous. And, uh, the backspacer and everything. And so, so this became a production model. So you said this was, uh, this was created uh, in a CNC or by CNC. Um, yep. Did you just hand them a model? They looked at it and turned it into a CAD thing or uh, uh so i drew everything up that i wanted uh with measurements and specs and all that kind of stuff um i got i emailed it to him took a picture of it emailed it to him uh and then he put it all into cad sent me a, a cad rendering of it and i said yeah you know change this that looks good and then he made um a prototype and sent that to me um you know some more back and forth and then uh finally decided on what I wanted and, and then he went into production. So you were talking about pricing before and you mentioned how um, your knives start around the 800 uh, mark and stuff like that. And, and people who are <clears throat> not in, uh, in the knife world or, or maybe they, they haven't uh, considered the rarefied air of custom knife making, explain to people what all that cost is. 800 bucks for a knife, what are you crazy? But these are handmade objects. Explain yeah. how you price something like that. Um, well, the way it was explained to me when I first got into it is that uh, the hard work was done by people that have been doing this for 20, 30 years, like Tom Mayo and those guys. Um, they're the ones that were able to get the market uh, to where it is today and, and uh, collector's prices. Um, for me, I just went off of kind of what the market was at and what I thought my work was worth, um, really what people were willing to pay for it, uh, kind of adjusted off of what the secondary market was showing at the beginning there and settled in on 800 uh, for a, a base folder, uh, which I, I don't plan on raising those prices anytime soon because, um, I mean, 800, I think, is is high enough already for one of my base model folders. Um, and it's, I don't feel the need to raise a price above that, you know? Um, and then when I was doing switch to making flippers, uh, I didn't know what to price them at. And Tom just said, well, is it more work? I'm like, well, yeah, it's a lot more work. And he's like, well then charge more. <laughs> so I just went up to a thousand for those. So how, how many hours, do you think you spend? I don't know if you can calculate that, but when you're when you're um, making, say, a base knife, like what what kind of work goes into that? It's all hand, right? It's all by hand yeah. and machine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the I did uh, time myself, and uh, on a base model folder, it was somewhere around twelve hours. Um, so I think that equated to somewhere around sixty bucks an hour or something like that. That's funny. I mean, it's, it's funny to me because 60 bucks an hour and yet you're producing an original work of uh, functional art, to, to, for yeah. lack of a better term. Uh, so, I mean, really, that's a that's a that's a bargain basement price. And uh, because you're putting your blood, sweat and tears in it and your own personal design, as well as like hand craftsmanship. Um, yeah. What, so how how does how much, how prolific can you be with these? How many of these things can you make? Like in a year, uh, for instance. Um, well, I mean, in a, a typical month, um, it just depends. 
a lot of guys, uh, just the process is, is different for everybody. You know, I, um, it depends on what model that I'm working with, whether I'm actually grinding from uh, stock metal or if I have water jet blanks cut. Um, but uh, I mean, the stuff obviously with the water jet blanks, it goes a lot faster because I'm not wasting belts and all that kind of stuff of trying to grind those out. Um, but if I'm starting everything with, with a water jet, uh, you know, I heat treat myself in, in house, but, um, in a month, I would say I do like five is comfortable. Five to six is, is comfortable in a month. And, and what are your favorite materials? I'm oh, sorry. Not, not in a month, uh, that, like two weeks in two weeks. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, I mean, you're, you you you've worked out a system. You can you can you kind of know how to do it. It just takes yeah. the time to do it. So, what are your favorite materials to work with? Um, I really like carbo quartz. Uh, I've always liked it what? Uh, since what I first that? saw it. Carbo, carbo quartz. Cor- What's that? Um, so that is, I think it came out of uh, Sweden. It is layers of carbon and quartz. So carbon as in carbon fiber and like quartz crystal. Uh, but it has like a, a really weird sheen to it when you get it in the light. It almost looks like uh, shale or coal from my crappy camera, but yeah. So and that's it, a handle yeah. material. Yeah. yeah. It's a handle material. Um, really expensive stuff. Uh, but if you, I mean, you buy it by the sheet, uh, mm-hmm. like an eight by 11 sheet, it's about half the price. And let's see, I can get the, you know, the, the end price down a little bit more in that. And that's, that's one thing too, that, um, I've heard from a lot of other people in the industry. Cause you know, I've only been in this industry really since the end of 2016, but, uh, my first show was the Hawaii knife show. Uh, I think it was January or February of 2017. Uh, and then after that year in 2017, I started going to shows on the mainland and really got my feet wet. Um, but something that I've heard quite a bit is that um, a lot of makers will upcharge for materials, mm. uh, which I mean, it makes a lot of sense because of the amount of extra time that you put in uh, for different exotic materials. But that's something that I, I try to just charge for the square inch of the material and then a little bit extra just for the, some of the work that goes into it. Uh, some of the materials, uh, don't they, um, don't they have an, a higher attrition rate with your expendables, like belts and stuff like that? Like, uh, can't you get a steel that's just going to chew up a whole bunch of belts that I could see that raising the price? Yeah. Uh, anything that's a steel that is harder. Um, cause I, I grind everything post heat treat. Okay. Um, so why, anything why do you do that? Uh, okay. you know, it was the method that I was shown by Tom, um, and it's also easier to heat treat and not worry about warping anything. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, the reason I asked so adamantly is uh, my extremely limited experience on a very cheap little uh, 2x42 uh, inch grinder. Um, I've tried both and naturally with no skill and very little time behind it and not great materials, I found that grinding before heat treat is obviously a lot easier uh, especially yeah. when you've got skills uh, like mine uh so but a lot of people recently that i've been talking to i've asked that question or that has come up and that yeah it's all post heat treat so you don't have to worry about warpage or anything like yeah. that uh, because you spend all this time especially with a folder where everything has to be within such tight tolerances Even right the yeah grind of the blade you can see if it's off when it's closed you know so yeah uh, I, I could see how you might want to just expend some of the belt money to make sure you're not expending the expensive steel money. Um, Hawaii, Ken Ken Onion. Yep. Any relation with him? Have you ever met Ken Onion? Or I've I've met him at shows, but that's about it. Uh, okay. it it's funny when he. I mean, Oahu is not that big, but when I mean. Uh, where I live on the North shore to where Ken is on the, the East coast. I mean, it's probably about 25 miles and that's a huge trip when you've been living here for a while. Hmm. So I just never end up getting over there to his side of the Island. 
it's just kind of cool to me. Like now, now I know of three great knife makers in Hawaii. Like, um, it's funny how different states seem to start rising. Like Pennsylvania is a great knife state. Oregon, mm -hmm. California, great knife states, and Hawaii seems to have something to it. Uh, you know that 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 attracts that attracts you all. Well, so what what kind of uh, you you mentioned before your business goals? What are your business goals? What what would you like? Uh, uh, Ed Cope and Valhalla, you go by Valhalla Knife Company, right? Uh, I go by Ed Cope Designs. It, um, legally, it's Valhalla Knife Company. Yeah. Okay. So where would you like Ed Cope Designs to be in 10 years? What's your What's your goal for this? Um, not too sure about 10 years. Uh, I definitely want to get back to the mainland at some point um, within the next eight years. Uh, but... I don't really want to expand where I have employees working for me. I like just working by myself and just having creative freedom over everything like that. Um, maybe having a little bit more uh, publicity from having collaboration with a, a, a production knife company would be nice. Um, but I really like where I'm at right now. Um, maybe just expanding uh, you know, the, the number of models that I have over the years that go by. And I, and I know that that's something that's going to come in time and that's nothing that I want to rush because I don't like, um, forcing my business into an area or, you know, in any Avenue, cause it's just something I, I want to do with my businesses, just have creative freedom with it. So if, if I go for a year without coming out with a new model, um, you know, I've had people criticize me for stuff like that, but it, it's, it's something that's how I want to run my business is just with the creative freedom to do two models in a year or none. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's the criticism? I'm just curious. Uh, just that I have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six models in my lineup and not more than that. But it, it I mean, I've only been in business for, five six years you know we are we are so spoiled and soft ed <laughs> ed where's your seventh design ed yeah i'm sorry but uh you know give the man a break he's uh, over here perfecting the folder for us thank you very much um but uh, yeah that's that's an interesting criticism to me because especially as someone who has uh, you know, you kind of have an atelier. You have it set up like an artist studio. You make your work, and and they sell as they're made. Uh, presumably, you don't have books, right? You just kind of make them and sell um, them. I, I do have books. Uh, oh, I was working on those. Um, I, I haven't opened my books since uh, October of 2017. Okay. Um, I still have a long ways to go on those. Uh, I don't think I'm even halfway through, and it's you know it's been three years. Um, mm. But I was working on those quite a bit last year for the first uh, half of last year. And then uh, with the plane crash that happened here in Hawaii, losing uh, six of my friends and my grandfather two days later, oh my just kind of sorry put a, a stop to that for a while. I'm just kind of trying to get back into that. And once um, this whole COVID-19 thing hit, I figured it would be easier just to make stuff and offer it online rather than, trying to go through my books to figure out who has the available funds, you know? Yeah, that's actually, that seems like a really smart approach. How, how has uh, this pandemic affected your business or life on Hawaii? Um, it has definitely slowed things down a little bit. Uh, just putting a knife online that's available, um, just like a base model. Uh, it, it takes maybe a week to sell it, whereas before it would be gone in a day or two. Mm -hmm. um, which is the case with the, that one that Ryan got that LR six. Um, but as far as living in Hawaii, I mean, not much has changed for me personally because I work from home, so I don't go out very much. So it's, right. you know, I kind of live the quarantine lifestyle already. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, I mean, school isn't starting for another two weeks. A school in Hawaii is supposed to start tomorrow, but it's not starting for another two weeks now. So. So that kind of, just... yeah, it puts a damper on production because now I got to watch my kids and make sure that they're, you know, not playing too many video games. Yeah, yeah, uh, we all hear that. So, uh, it, it, you fly in your spare time, is that right? Or, or you know, for yeah, um, 
I moved out here 10 years ago and shortly after moving out here, I saw uh, the Magnum PI helicopter flying around the island. And uh, I learned about that, you know, they do tours. And um, so I've wanted that job for the last 10 years. And I was kind of what I was hoping and aiming for when I got out of the military um, because the knife making wasn't even on the horizon. And uh, I was always told by everybody as a junior aviator that you needed 2000 hours for the insurance company to be able to cover you for the company to hire you. Uh, and I got out with just shy of 1500 hours. So mm. I didn't, I didn't think I was employable. I mean, one of the companies that I emailed um, wouldn't even respond because I didn't have 2000 hours. Uh, so I didn't really push hard into that. Um, and then that's where I went into the knife making instead. But then uh, once again, through church in a, a small home group, met a, another friend that was one of their mechanics and he's like yeah let me introduce you to the people down there and uh they had a opening come up uh, like a week or two later and i put my application and they got hired hmm. so i was back in december and i flew from the end of january through the beginning of march and then the lockdown hit and i haven't flown since uh, uh, I, I don't know i don't i'm not a pilot but it seems like that's got to be like not driving. It's like clipping your wings, but in your yeah. case, way more literally. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was, it was a lot of fun flying that helicopter that I've always wanted to. And all of a sudden it just stopped. Is that the, uh, is that that, uh, uh, dual turbine, uh, 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 helicopter that most police, uh, is that a bell that most police? Uh, no. So, um, the one that I flew in the military was a, a bell helicopter. The one that the, typical police helicopter that you see right, right. Uh, the Magnum PI one is that loach the oh, uh, right. the little bird that the 160th flies okay so when you're flying what do you carry with you what's or what do you carry anyway what's your what's your carry knife but also when you fly do you bring something special uh, I number one I always carry water uh, that's gonna be your biggest thing <laughs> um, before anything else, you know, uh, especially in, in a non-combat environment. Um, and then I usually just carry one of my own knives, which is, uh, the SR 33 flipper model. Okay. That's, that's the Warncliffe. That's the, okay. Yep. Yeah. That's what I was getting at. I, I knew you carried water and all, all sorts of other stuff that doesn't cut. I guess water does cut certain things like whiskey and other things, but uh, hey, you yeah, can well, cut titanium in the right conditions. Uh, that's right. That's right. Put a little sand in it and blast it at yeah. high speeds. Um, so, uh, uh, fixed blade knives, any fixed blade knives? Uh, I've probably done under 10 fixed blade knives altogether. I don't like doing them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so you came to me, uh, at least my knowledge, uh, as a folder maker and that's, that's how you will remain especially knowing that, that you came up under Tom Mayo and uh, some others. Before we wrap, I, I want to find out from you who some of your other influences are in, in knife making. Um, I mean, Tom was the biggest one. Uh, creatively, Onzo, a lot of the stuff that he had um, like five, six years ago uh, influenced where I started. Um, Strider is another big one, just his style uh, that I try to emulate. Um, Nalu is another local guy out here in Hawaii. Uh, I really like his just very clean looking uh, stuff. Um, but other than that, I mean, I really try to just do my own thing. That, that's the biggest uh, attraction to being self-employed as a knife maker, just being able to do what I want. Well, from my perspective, uh, uh, your work is very clean and artistic, a little bit aggressive, which uh, is high on my, uh, I, I like that. I like the way that, I like the feeling that leaves me with, but uh, it, it's very graceful work. And I, I think it's beautiful and kind of kind of brutish at the same time. And to me, those are like, uh, those are yeah, kind that's of- Yeah, kind of that's kind of what I'm aiming for. It's It's a good, contradiction uh or or, yeah. or you know whatever you want to call it uh coming together you know sort of brute brute and grace and yeah. uh and I, I think it's quite compelling where can people find you catch up with you um get on your books if that's possible or find your work 
So I do everything through Instagram, uh, which is Ed Cope Designs underscore between you know each word. Um, that's where I do most of my selling. Uh, you know, if I'm not at a show or something like that, that's where people have contacted me for my books and all that kind of stuff. And so, how are you um, making up for the fact that Blade Show isn't happening? Is that was that on your radar, or you know, honestly, I wasn't going to do Blade this year, anyways. Mm-hmm. Um, really didn't like how it felt last year. I saw a lot of custom makers with knives on their table the second day, and. I just felt that it, it made a real shift um, from the custom knife world into uh, production knives. And mm. it was just, for me personally, coming from Hawaii with the six hour time change, it was too much to want to do it again. I mean, I might do it again at some point in the future, but I just, I didn't want to do it again this year. I think uh, I think everyone in every industry has learned through this pandemic experience that, uh, um, you know, even even though there's there, it's a kind of a sad substitute to have something virtual that has always been, um, yeah, you know, actual, um, you know, life can go on. Uh, hopefully, I really hope I can get to Blade Show next year. I've never been, and uh, we were uh, Jim, my partner, and I were going to go this year. Uh, Jim, who's working his magic behind the, the screen here. Uh, but, you know, obviously that was waylaid until next year, and hopefully next year it happens. Um, so, I don't know. It's an interesting uh, interesting little vexation we find ourselves in, um, especially for, for um, people who are relying on that to make their annual nut, you know. But, uh, yeah. Well, it's, I, I mean, going to the shows is, is definitely uh, big for custom knife makers. I, I think... Tom told me his business took off. I, I think he said it doubled after he started going to the shows on the mainland. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so it, it definitely makes a big difference for people to actually talk to the maker and meet them and then obviously handle the knife and see what it actually feels like. Well, uh, you know, if if I were you, I might be uh, grateful to myself that I had kept things streamlined, especially in a time like this. You get to set up your shop like an artist make what you want to make. You have some uh, orders to fulfill, of course, but uh, you're kind of um, you're kind of taking your own cues. And uh, I, I think uh, that's an enviable position. I think a lot of people, no matter what their industry, would like to be taking their own cues. Uh, so Ed Cope, I'd like to say, man, congratulations on, on your uh, snowballing knife career. I think you got some Thank beautiful you. work. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, any, a- anything you'd like to tell uh, up and comers uh, maybe a, a tidbit of advice you'd like to tell up and comers. Uh, uh, I, I, like for myself and my experience, I think the biggest thing was just finding somebody that has been in the game for a while. Um, and it's not just one person, you know. I, Tom taught me a lot of the, the physical aspects of making a knife. Um, Hank Greenberg taught me a lot about the knife world. Uh, so just finding a couple different people to help you on all aspects of the business, you know, running a business, making knives, um, making a name for yourself in the knife world. Those are three big aspects of it. Great. Well, Ed Cope, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you.